Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so uh, welcome to this session, um, which is about uh, teaching VCE chemistry. And um, I'm really happy to be joined by three um, members of the Early Career Chemistry Network. Um, I want to start by acknowledging that um, uh, we're on, well, I'm on um, Wurundjeri country, the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. Um, I think it's uh, really important to, in um, NAIDOC week, well, it's really important all the time, but really important in NAIDOC week to um, acknowledge country and acknowledge um, that there is rich and often unrecognised science uh, that's held within um, Wurundjeri and other Indigenous communities um, around Australia. Um, I'm going to introduce the three presenters. So. Uh, Alex, on my screen, Alex is uh, just to my my left and Nicole and Michelle are to my right, and I'm sure they're not there on your screen. Um, but I want to say that for all of you, the Early Career Network, Early Career Chemistry Network is a really valuable resource, and I think they're going to be talking about, um, about that uh, a little bit, but um, the Early Careers Chemistry Network, it's a committee passionate chemistry educators who support the transition of new and re-entering um, chemistry teachers to the profession. Uh, they're fo focused on providing resources through the Facebook page and the Facebook page is great uh, if, uh, if you're not on it already. Um, free events that are online or in person. Um, uh, they run professional development, it's free and it counts towards VIT hours. Um, SAC writing, auditing workshops, and uh, do mentoring of early career um, chemistry educators. And um, I'm going to leave them to um, talk about what they're going to be doing um, in the session today. But uh, I hope you will all join me in thanking them for, um, for presenting. Um, so thanks very much, and I'll pass on to you guys. Thanks for that. I might kick us off because I've got the first part of the presentation. Um, can I just get a thumbs up if you can see my screen there? Great. Excellent. Um, so I'm just going to put it into present mode, um, if that's going to work for me. All right. So um, Alex is the ECCN president and he'll be speaking a bit later on. He's at Trinity Grammar School and Michelle and I are both at Whittlesea Secondary College. And today is about teaching BCE chemistry. Uh, this was a previous slide, sorry. It's about teaching BCE chemistry for today. Um, we've got lots of resources in the Dropbox link um, and this is all of the resources that we've been accumulating over a number of years keep getting added to this um, same folder. So there's things from the, from the November lectures today, from um, sample plans, annotated workbooks, practical resources, task words, the list goes on. So we're a subsidiary organisation, as Mick just explained, part of the Chemistry Education Association, which has that $10 lifetime membership, which is absolutely worth it. Um, and our objective is really to support the Victorian secondary school chemistry teachers that are early in their career by developing and sharing resources, providing opportunities for collaboration, and networking through workshops and social events. Um, I really encourage joining the committee as well if you're a, a passionate chemistry educator or if you just want to learn more about chemistry. Um, and this, these events also are free of charge and count towards BIT professional development hours. So we're all volunteers and we do this because we really, really want to support those entering the profession. But we are also um, early careers chemistry teachers ourselves. So as Mick mentioned, we've got the Brains Trust on the Facebook page. Um, so please just search Early Careers Chemistry Network and then submit a request to join the group. And as mentioned, we've also got all the prior resources um, in this slide. And I believe that we'll try and upload the slide into the chat or it's also the Dropbox link. Dropbox link is um, in the chat at the moment as well. So just a bit of an idea of some of the things that we cover in our presentation. Um, so if we look at past VCA exams, uh, VCAA exams and the mark distribution, this is something that um, Alex put together, breaking down the unit three and four questions. And you can see it's pretty well divided. Also a uh, Bloom's taxonomy analysis, uh, looking at the um, further uh, application skills and analysis as well as knowledge um, and a lot less of that focus on calculation, which was a previous focus in, in past VCAA exams. 
Also, the uh, marks as a percentage of the exam in the different areas of study um, throughout the study design. So this is the kind of thing that we put together. This is also a breakdown of the most difficult topics as measured by the percentage of marks lost. So the average number of marks available and the marks that were lost. Um, and you can see that further to the um, top right, they're the more difficult subjects and um, they're the ones where more marks were lost as well. So the analysis of molecules, equilibrium, electrolysis, practical investigation, these are ones where there are frequently more marks available um, and more marks that are lost. So it really helps you to direct your focus. And this is the kind of thing that we present throughout the year as the ECCN. So uh, my role, oops, sorry, my screen is blocking that slide there. Um, my role is the, I'm the learning specialist in, uh, in curriculum. So I uh, look at curriculum development throughout the entire school. And um, my part of the presentation today, I'll be looking at the entire year planning, goals and success criteria, assessment tracking, hyperlinking and resource provision to students, all as a part of curriculum documentation and planning beforehand. So I'm really putting forward suggestions. These aren't necessarily the only way for you to be doing something. Um, and of course, every person and every, per, uh, every school and every person will do it slightly differently. You've got to work with um, what your school is actually stipulating and also what works for you. Um, my suggestion is to try and make it a flexible and working document, something that you're continually adding up to throughout the year and something that you can share with others and collaborate on. So if you use SharePoint, OneDrive or Google Drive, um, have it uploaded on the cloud so that it can continually be updated. And particularly if you have multiple classes. Um, also to include goals, activities, literacy support, hyperlinks. These are the things that you can include in a, in a unit plan. And use what currently exists as a guide. So um, there's of course the resources produced by um, Penny up on the CEA website, which is a suggested timeline for the for teaching VCE chemistry. Um, so use either current existing um, curriculum documents that are out there and adapt them or something that someone else has. Try and actually don't start from scratch because it's much, much better to modify something. So this is a bit of an example of the entire year planning, some of the detail that you might like to go into. So I like to break it down lesson by lesson because it's a bit easier for me to um, track which PowerPoints I need to have ready at, at what time. Um, and I just dot point for myself what I'm actually doing in that lesson. So enjoying the chemistry slides, um, get to know you in terms of just a kind of well-being and um, personal attributes and things like that quiz. And then a bit of an access prior knowledge quiz as well, periodic table labeling tasks, gluing in the study design. So whatever you need to set yourself up. So I include all of this in my curriculum documentation. And then to the left there, I also include the, um, the blue is either homework or extension tasks. So I, I like to color coordinate my curriculum documentation. Um, and I like to um, also include my prax in there in a different color in yellow. And then I've also got RA with a tick next to it there to say that I've done the risk assessment. So I use my curriculum document to kind of keep track of everything. And I have my assessments in red. So I've got their assignment that's due in week two um, that they will begin in the first 20 minutes of the class. So this is a, an example of a way to do a curriculum document. Um, and then you can also break down the learning intentions and success criteria. As I mentioned, it's really about what your school and individually what your focus is. And this is a focus from our school at the moment is to break down the learning intentions and um, the further break down the success criteria. So looking at NMR as an example, identifying that um, really breaking down that all students should be able to identify the principles and applications of proton and carbon NMR and that most should be able to determine the structure of a simple organic compound. Some will be able to analyze the spectra and determine a number, um, the number and nature of carbon environments in a simple organic compound. So um, this is just really breaking down the study design a little bit more. And this, this goal that I've just broken down there, this is that next point that I'm moving on to about the goals and success criteria in your curriculum documents. So, um, what I've done, uh, and I'm happy to share this resource as well, is this is directly the line from the study design. 
I've taken that and I've just kind of translated it so that it's got a verb in front of it. So it's a bit more kind of applic applicable of what the students need to be able to do. And then what I've also done further to that is I've added what all, most and some should be doing and tried to also include um, particularly uh, specifically exam questions that are built into that dot point in the study design. So it's something that I find quite useful to track um, the students learning and, and to help them keep on track. And I use it at the start of the class. You can see those three boxes there. I originally had the score where they would mark their confidence relative to that goal. Um, and then they would do it at the start and at the end of the lesson out of a four point scale. So if they started as a one, they end up as a four, then you know that they really nailed that lesson, whereas sometimes they can drop off. So it's a good way to kind of track their, um, their engagement in the class. I also have there a revision score and an assessment score. As I mentioned, I've kind of refined this goal and success criteria document. So that was a bit vague. Um, now I, I call it the exam prep score. And these are just the assignments that I hand out um, that aren't SACs that are uh, exam questions for them. And then finally, the assessment score is, of course, the SAC score. And I, um, at the moment, I'm going through the process of blacking out the SAC scores to show um, which, which uh, parts of the study design are related to the SAC. So I'll show that in the assessment tracking part um, coming up. Uh, I'm just going to stop there for a moment just to check if anyone has um, any questions, if that's all making sense. I'll just give you couple of seconds to digest any questions about that. Okay, well good, I'll continue on. All right, so. Okay, in terms of assessment tracking, um, some suggestions that I've, I'm putting forward as well for tracking your assessments. Um, of course, always reflecting the VCAA principles of being valid and reasonable, equitable, balanced and efficient. Um, I try and use those goals and success criteria sheets that I showed in the previous slide and get students to highlight the cells that the SAC will be on or I'm planning to current to black it out before they actually get it so that they know what the SAC will be on. Um, and I'll show in the next slide what this is, but that you can also use like a SAC guideline to break it down. And the absolute ideal, it's stating the obvious, is having a rough idea of the SACs or having the actual SACs for 2021 in 2022, uh, 2021 in 2020. Um, that's only going to save yourself down the track. So what that actually looks like, the, um, what's going on here? So the um, SAC guideline, this is what it looks like, and this is something from the um, ECCN that's up in Dropbox as well. So uh, for unit one, how can the diversity of material be explained, breaking down the area of study and the outcomes and then the assessment tasks that come along with it. So it's really just the study design simplified for you to be able to track what you're doing. Um, I like to personally work with um, small cards and I like to try and track um, what's going on in my, in my study design and um, I just found out actually only about uh, half an hour ago that I'm taking the year 11 and year 12 combined chemistry course next year. So to try and track what's going on, I'm um, planning out when I'll be doing um, both of these different parts of the, era, of the study design for year 11 and year 12 and pairing them together and seeing where the SACs kind of work out together. So uh, whatever approach works for you, if you want to tabulate it, you want to do it on a document or if you want to print out some little cards of the different parts of the study design and shuffle them all on your table, um, just do whatever works for you. Just a couple of suggestions of things to hyperlink in curriculum documents. Um, and I would suggest as well to share this with the students. There's no point in showing them exactly what you're planning on doing with them. Uh, there's no point in hiding that, sorry. Um, the Edrollo videos, if you can include those as hyperlinks, as well as YouTube clips that are extensions, Tyler Dewitt's always a great one. Um, my slides, which can be found on SharePoint. So that's something that I would suggest is that you hyperlink your PowerPoint slides. Obviously, we were recording PowerPoint slides this year as well. So maybe you have a couple of those that you could share with students to allow them to um, just extend on that even more. Um, exam preparation quizzes as well um, at Google Forms and the amazing Weebly, uh, Weebly website that exists out there, um, O'Shea's website. So these are all really great resources to include in the curriculum document. And I really strongly suggest actually sharing your curriculum document with the students so that they, um, it's, it's not going to, it's not going to cause any harm by telling them exactly what they need to do. But of course, you'll need to read your specific context. If that's going to cause a bit of an anxiety spiral for your class, then maybe that's not um, the best thing for them. 
Uh, finally, uh, about resource provision to students, um, I've, uh, this is something that I'm planning to bring into next year as well. I'm planning on separating out um, content with summary sheets, flow charts, um, any readings that they need, as well as questions. So exam questions um, that I've included in my slides that I have just taken out and put into a Word document and work solutions. So this is something that I'm planning on developing and sharing with my students. The content booklet could be made by actually um, compiling study summary sheets together and including an index table at the beginning, which quickly quickly takes them through the document. Um, I'll show you this to you in a moment as well. I also made a quizlet for each of the chapters in the Heinemann booklet, and I've included that um, as hyperlinks. So this content booklet is a really good online resource for them because obviously you can't access a hyperlink when it's in um, print. Um, the questions booklet has come from the PowerPoint slides. So all of my slides, I include exam questions from various resources um, and I've been taking them out so that I was finding at the start of the year that if I projected an exam question, the students couldn't engage with it as well as if they had it in front of them. So um, I've got all of their exam questions now in a uh, working document and it allows, um, it allows me to print it out and, and get them to work through the questions and keep it all as one. So I'll show, um, I'll just show what that looks like um, just for now. So can everybody see my contents page? Um, sorry, I can't see you. Can I get a thumbs up? Yep, excellent, thank you. <laughs> All right, so um, you can see I've got the study design uh, goals and success criteria. So um, if I head on to, oh, sorry, it's not moving like it should. Um, so, this is the study design goals and success criteria. So they have that at the front of their booklet. So we constantly refer to that again and again. And then this is the content booklet. So um, I can't actually remember where I can credit these resources from, but the um, these summary pages are for each of the different areas of study and it allows students to really go back and go over things rather than having to rewatch a presentation and use up all their time with that because we know of course with chemistry it's not so much about how much can you stuff into your brain it's about how much can you apply it to a question so um, this is a really good way for them to just go over that content before they go into the application of the questions so this is my content booklet um, and my um, this is my questions booklet it's the same thing again it's hyperlinked but ideally this would be printed out so this one is provided to the students um, it's got the goals in it. And then there, these are exam questions that uh, were from my slides. So um, it allows a bit of space for students to be doing their workings out. And then this is obviously what we're working on um, in class. And it's quite a large document, um, but it means that they have it all as a booklet so they can constantly be referring back to um, the gaps in their knowledge. I also have included in this the um, exam hints revision and an annotated data booklet at the back there, um, page 125. So this allows them to, this is a, a great resource. Um, I can't remember who it's from, but James Kennedy, I think it is. Um, so the annotated data booklet's a great one for them to really break it down a little bit more. Um, if they don't know how to use the data booklet, this really helps them to navigate the data booklet. So I found, um, I found that quite useful and particularly because I know that I'm going into teaching year 11 and 12 combined in one class. If I can get everything as organized as I can and allow it to, them to move through it seamlessly, that's only gonna help me and them um, and free me up to have a bit more discussion with them in class. So uh, finally, just a little bit of reflection post COVID. Um, this is something that I actually, uh, I can't claim. It's something that I was inspired by um, Ben Williams at the VC chemistry conference at the beginning of the year. Um, so my really big takeaway from COVID-19 was that I was able to give feedback to students in a way that was really quite productive to them. Um, so I was classifying feedback based on Ben Williams suggestions about whether it was a mistake, whether they didn't read the question, whether there was content gaps or if it was left blank. And that's just a little clip there of my, um, just a couple of my students showing how they went through different questions. You can see you start to draw patterns and um, with 7b, for example, there was a bit of a mistake and there was a bit of a content gap there. And uh, it allowed me to analyze the exam paper a little bit more and see how uh, my students shortfall essentially with that. Um, so that's it for me. Oh, this is a, a unit timeline as well that I mentioned from Penny Commons. This is the one that exists up on the CEA website, but we've also got it up there on um, Dropbox. 
Uh, so I'll just stop sharing and I'll pass it over to, um, that's the link to the annotated data booklet. I think uh, next up is Alex, is that right? Whoops, there we go. Yeah, good. Thanks, Nicole. I just uh, took an extra second to get used to Zoom. Thanks for that. So I'm Alex, I'm president of the ECCN. I work at Trinity and um, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about uh, assessments that we've run and other schools have run. So I spoke to Maria James, I had a good conversation with her. Uh, she can't endorse all of what I'm gonna say as these are the gold standard tasks, but I just wanted to go through and pick out what, what do the actual tasks mean when we um, are taking those from the study design? And there's an audit report. If you've really got some time and you're interested, um, it's a 35 page document, go and read it. But anyway, it goes through basically all of the, the different um, tasks and what teachers have done and what's accepted and what's not. So this year, you know, not a lot of schools got audited, but whoops, sorry, uh, but in the future, and getting my mistake. So we're jumping around there. Yeah, there'll be more auditing going on, especially in the final years of the study design. And, and Maria said that they will be stricter on um, tasks they accept. And as Nicole spoke to, like the equity and diversity of the tasks specifically. So not just having four tests, five tests throughout the year, trying to diversify the tasks. So I just wanted to touch on a couple of things that I thought would be useful um, that I would have not liked to have known you know, a, few, a few years ago. So I'm just going to go, I didn't choose all of the tasks in each area of study. I just chose a couple and what do I think or um, what, what would be a benefit for us. I'm just going to um, kind of present a few. So yeah, unit three, you might choose, for example, up here, report on a lab investigation. So many of us do looking at the in, uh, energy content of fuels. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. But for comparison of electricity generating cells, um, Maria spoke specifically about just making sure that it's only two cells. So you're, you're comparing uh, a fuel cell perhaps to uh, a galvanic cell, but not including electrolytic cells. So there are some sample tasks on that link I shared before, Pat O'Shea's website, the Weebly, um, which is useful to, to help with that task there. And then for area study two in unit three, again, not all of the ta task types are here. I've just put a couple. Um, so if, it, for, if it's annotation of practical activities, you might have them do a rate to reaction prac, for example, or an equilibrium prac, uh, you know, say for example, nitrous, oil, um, no, nitrous oxide rather, you know, the standard one, with the brown to, to, to white color, and then they'd compare the two pracs. How does the safety compare? What are the risks associated? So it doesn't just have to be content questions um, with those annotations maybe want to talk about the general trends of those as well. For unit four, it's just, again, just a little glimpse of some of the clarifications from Maria. So if you're doing structured questions, which let's be honest, many of us like to do because they're probably easier to write and they prepare students arguably better for the exam, but she's um, clearly said, and the advice for teachers have said the same thing, uh, which I'll give you a link to in a second. And the advice of teachers says that you're not supposed to have uh, multiple choice questions in there. So you're not allowed to have multiple choice questions in your response to structured questions. And if you choose to put them in there, they'll um, call your task not valid and ask further information. And you know, you'll have to be ordered again. Let's say in unit three, if you didn't pass, you'd have to be ordered again in unit four. And then if, yeah, it just means more work for everyone. So I think if you can avoid it, um, don't put multiple choice questions in there. Questions in there. And, you know, you can't use VCAR exams. You have to modify the questions significantly. You don't want students to be unfairly prepared compared to others. Um, using commercial past papers, um, that's, that's an, a bit of a no as well. Um, you have to adapt it reasonably. So yeah, you can use the diagrams and the question stems, but um, Mary found a lot of the schools were using the same um, Sacks and, and fair enough, writing a question is challenging and takes a lot of time. So we totally understand why we do it and, why, and I'm, I'm guilty of doing the same. But um, that's one of the things I think they'll come down harder on, particularly in, as the, the study design in 2022, when it, when it changes over, they'll be a lot more strict on that, I think. 
Um, and then for area study three, I just jumped before, yeah, okay. Area study three, the, the key comments you said that um, when you're doing a prac, the investigations, they should be student driven and they shouldn't be questions that are just yes or no. So if you're looking at Faraday's laws, it's a, it's a great question to bring all the concepts together. You know, you, you change the thickness of the electrodes or you change the current or you change the, the, the voltage that you're putting in to the system. All of that can be explained by Faraday's law. So if you increase the current, you should get more mass plated on the cathode. If you decrease the current, the opposite will happen. So students should already know that based upon the relationship of the equation. So those kind of questions, they're trying to phase out or discourage people from doing. They're trying to move towards um, people doing a task which is not like that. That being said, you wouldn't um, be disqualified or um, not pass an audit for that kind of task, but th that's where it's moving towards. Um, and All right, so here are some ideas of tasks that you might um, like to develop or, or use. And this is what I've spoken to Maria about. Again, she can't endorse or give it the VCAR stamp of approval, but these are just some ideas that um, she put in the report. So if you go up to the top here, uh, this will take you to the audit report on the VCAR website, it's a, it's a Word doc. And then this will take you to the advice of teachers as well. And I think we've got it in the Dropbox as a Word doc, because the, on, on the uh, website, there's about four different documents. So it's, I think this is a, a Word doc. Anyway, so what you might um, do, and again, Pat O'Shea, these are some ideas from his website. Um, for the first task, when you're doing analysis of stimulus material, you might look at energy demands, like the snowy hydro going up, or you might look at the Vales, the Vales Point being um, refinanced, what was it, for another couple of years. So current issues in energy demands, you look at the Tesla battery, the, the battery in Victoria that's in Geelong, the, the, uh, announced a week or two ago, 800 jobs or something like that. So having students um, analyze those for energy efficiency transformation. So you'd give them an article from a piece of from paper or, or some sort of source, an online website. And then maybe you'd ask some chemical equations on that. Like how are the biofuels made from that energy source? If it was perhaps taking out um, uh, ethanol from, from, uh, from bananas like they do in Queensland, all the leftover bananas, the odd bunch, they never make it to the supermarket. Instead of just being chucked out, they try and use them for renewables. So that might be something you do there. Uh, and, and these are just some questions. I'm not gonna read them all out and speak to them all uh, because, of, because of timing, but you've, you've got the PowerPoint. Uh, and then maybe for hydrogen fuels, you could, you could do something like that. Uh, for the laboratory based investigation, We've done it this year and that worked quite well. So instead of just burning ethanol and trying to determine the enthalpy of ethanol or other fuels, which can be taken from a data table, instead we diluted ethanol with water. So 100% pure ethanol, 90%, 80%, 70, all the way up to 50. And then we tried to look at um, how does the energy content differ or does the fuel light? So having students try and answer questions which could bring their, uh, their concepts and their knowledge together, but something that's not just confirming a relationship um, as such. Um, sorry, I'll just read the chat. Um, whoops. All right, anyway, uh, where are we? Maybe you look at if, if there's blends of particular fuels. So if you put 10% ethanol and 90% of another fuel, how does the energy content there differ? And maybe you compare different blends of fuels and therefore what would be the optimal blend of fuel to, to burn or combust in a school laboratory, laboratory. For the electricity generating cells, these are just some ideas what you could do. So you'd have a, um, a mercury battery. So something that's perhaps unknown to the students, um, which is, mercury oxide and zinc, and then you might compare the dry cell. So if you use the, uh, the, VIC, uh, the Heinemann textbook um, in, the, in the student practical booklet, there's a great prac um, that we can speak to, I'm sure, about using the hydrogen oxygen fuel cell with a potassium hydroxide electrolyte. So you can compare the efficiency of those or the likes. And these are some of the points that you might touch on.
And then you might even compare, well, what's the operating, operating conditions of those? Well, like how does the MSDS differ? Like what particular uh, conditions or safety equipment do we need? So it doesn't just have to be content questions on like what's the energy or the uh, inert value and um, how much carbon dioxide do they make? Give me some redox equations. So you can diversify your questions if you'd like um, on that there, just to give you a bit more breadth. For area study two, the electrolysis experiments that um, um, you know, many of us have done, I'm sure, quite a few times or have seen that are tried and tested. You might change the, the, the thickness of electrodes or the surface area, and then you'd have students compare those. So how does the, you know, the, the mass of the cathode differ across um, these two parameters? Or how is the MSDS different? Or how are the errors different? Like, did you have random errors associated with one prac? Did you have systematic errors associated with another? Why is that, perhaps? Another one is you actually change the electrodes. So you might have, you're plating the same metal. Let's say you're plating copper metal and you have two electrodes. How does that actually change the amount of copper? So do you have a zinc electrode at, the, um, at one end or do you physically change the shape? Is it a cylinder? Is it a square? Is it a... I don't know, you make some interesting shapes of those electrodes and have students try and investigate that, see if the surface area or shape affects how much metal is plated. For data and um, generalizations, that was one that I was a little bit confused about. I wasn't so sure about um, the breadth of what that could be when I, before I spoke to Maria about that. And she was talking uh, quite specifically about having some sort of graph or data so the, the students could, let's say if we're talking about electrolysis here or equilibrium, you'd have to have a graph and you'd be plotting two values against each other, independent, dependent. Uh, and then what's on what axis, what's the most appropriate way to represent that data? Should it be a bar chart, should it be a line graph? We don't do a lot of that in chemistry compared to say biology where that has been on the exam. The chemistry hasn't been, so that's probably where we're getting at. Are there any trends in those graphs? What kind of trends? Uh, and then you know, just conscious of time. So again, the generalizations for area study one of unit four, you could look at boiling point, melting point, viscosity, flash point. And that could be the students researching that data, creating a graph and then comparing it to molecular forces, making predictions about longer chains, what happens. And that's, what, that's the point of this graph here, just to sort of um, allude to that. If you're looking at two practical activities, uh, there's another, again, another in the um, Heinemann textbook, I don't want everyone to have to reinvent the wheel, trying to pull as much resources as we can. Uh, in the Heinemann student workbook, there's this practical here. So you, they make comparisons about lots of activities, uh, sorry, comparisons about lots of um, hydrocarbons, unsaturated and saturated. So making comparisons with iodine, comparing solubility, comparing, um, their flammability, et cetera, their reactions with manganate or another um, oxidant or reductant, depending what you're using. And then for unit four, there's the same thing as just before. And the last one um, for area study two, or one of the last ones, area study two there is, when you're comparing food molecules, you're comparing only two molecules. So that was really one of the key things from that audit report. That it's could only be two molecules in multiple scenarios. They can be both in the same category. So for example, um, this year you might not have done it because it's out of the course, but you do glucose and aspartame and you compare those the whole way through your assessment. Energy content, you know, bonds, solubility in water, um, chirality, again, not this year, but that might be something you do, or you choose proteins and sugars and you choose a molecule or a particular set of each of those. So only two molecules is the real key thing. And then again, what I've said here, you make comparisons about those. This is just a snippet from the order report. I'm not gonna read all of that, but these are some of the areas of concern that Maria highlighted um, in terms of what was not done so well by schools and what's in the next study design iteration. So not next year, the one after. I think, let's pretend all of this stays, let's pretend all of this area study three stays to the same extent. These are the things they're gonna be pushing and trying to um, make sure the schools are doing
to the standard that they're after. And so they're just the key points I wanted to highlight. Um, so not making direct, if you're having a relationship, students shouldn't just be confirming that, that, that practical there. There's already a, an equation made for that reason. Um, and then the key thing is, another key thing is making sure they get primary data. So students generate their own data. If they use a class data set for their experiment, that's fine, but they need to generate that data for their experiment and their question. Um, and it yeah, shouldn't have any yes or no answers. So this here is what I've already said about um, the, the, it's taken direct quotation from the report up there. If you add more electricity, you're going to get more mass and electrodes. So it's just a confirmation question. So just avoid that. So some of the questions that you might choose, and, and again, this is taken from the report, um, as opposed to how accurate is the energy content of biscuits? Because realistically, no school is going to have a bomb calorimeter, or maybe they'll go and um, do an excursion with Mick at the at the Uni Melbourne Uni, and they can get they can answer those, answer those questions. So that would be appropriate. But most schools aren't going to have a bomb calorimeter or a calorimeter that can determine that energy content of food. So what's reported on the packet or the biscuit packet, for example, is going to be far more accurate than than say what you're going to be able to determine in a school. So not a ideal practical to do. Although saying that, I remember a few years ago, we, we burnt Fruit Loops and the students got 97% accuracy compared to the packet. So it, it can be done, but there, the point that Marie's trying to raise is there are better ways to ask the question and trying to have the more exploratory kind of questions. So these are some examples that she gave and um, have been in the report, as opposed to just affirming the energy content or looking at which releases the most energy, why not look at how does energy differ from respiration compared to comb combusting that? Or if you're doing lemons and you're doing a titration of acetic acid, how does the vitamin C, sorry, not a C, um, a, a redox titration there rather, how does the, the vitamin C content differ across different lemons? Because determining vitamin C content using titrations is not very accurate in a school environment. Now, you know, the students who did it a while ago in New Zealand, who, who worked out that Ribena had less vitamin C than oranges, even though the ad claims the other way. Um, obviously that was confirmed in a lab. So the students were, you know, it was, it was a great question to have and, and get them to think about it and, and affirm those results, but yeah, you wouldn't get results that are accurate enough to report in court or, or, or take them to somewhere where they'd be accurate. Anyway, so that's uh, my little take on what uh, Maria and I spoke about. And then this here is just um, showing how you might sequence a practical investigation. I'm not gonna go through this really because it's there for you to read. And we've talked about this before. Um, the only thing I do wanna cover, I'm just lagging a little bit here. Um, so, what I do want to cover is just be aware of how you're going to split up. This year was obviously very difficult to do the PRAC and we said we didn't have to do a physical generation of primary data, but when do you want to do it? It's something to consider. And, excuse me, sorry, the topics therefore that you could do and, and having spoken to Maria and now being a bit more aware of what's required. Um, so for a few of the major topics I've just talked about, some of the things you might choose to do in your area study three that gives student choice um, to a degree and hopefully they're relatively easy to set up uh, for the teacher and the, the lab techs and uh, easy to answer as well relatively so you can still use galvanic cells and change the thickness of like um, the salt bridge sorry not salt bridge um, thickness of electrodes that should be maybe the temperature of the electrolyte but just being mindful that that gets a bit complex because you've got to factor in the Nernst equation, which is beyond the course. So maybe electrolytic cells is more appropriate. Calorimetry, you can look at how insulated the calorimetry is and the thickness of it or the type of insulation. Those are uh, perfectly um, minimal practice to vary year on year. And you, know, you can use one one year and then you know, the next year use it again um, with a varied uh, independent variable. For food, you could change enzymes, a lot of things about them. 
and vitamin C, as I said, and perhaps titrations on lemons or different citrus fruits. So this here just goes through on how to conduct the experiment or some ideas, it's not, it's not the, the only way, and then how you might choose to assess the poster. And I'll uh, leave it there and hand over to Michelle. Don't have any questions. Okay. All right. Does anybody have any questions with regards to what Alex was talking about before I begin? No, so basically what I want to talk about is with regards to delivering your content in the classroom is um, when I basically first taught um, year 12 or year 11 chemistry, what I found was that I spent a lot of time out the front of the classroom explaining the concepts. Then I assigned the students some work with regards to practicing you know calculations and those kind of things and then whatever they didn't finish in class became homework but what i found that a lot of students then came back to class the next day and hadn't completed the homework because they didn't totally understand what they were doing from the calculation and applying point of view so basically what i came up with is i actually flipped the classroom so the content i gave them to learn for homework now that could have been reading a section of the textbook, could have been watching a video. Those of you that have Ed Rollo, well, Ed Rollo is absolutely fantastic because it's all sort of outlined for you. But there are also other great resources as well. If you don't have Ed Rollo, you can use things like Crash Course and also Khan Academy is another one that's really, really good um, from a teaching point of view. Um, and then while they're looking at those videos at home, or reading the textbook, the section of the textbook, um, what I get them to do is I get them to write their own notes. Okay, and then the other thing I get them to do is if they come across something that they don't really understand, to write a question. Okay, so that I can basically um, go through it with them in class. Now, the thing to do is that, you know, the more homework you get, you give them, the less likely they are to do it. So try and keep it to a minimum, or I should say a maximum of around about 30 minutes. Okay, now some days it might go over, some days it might go less, but if you can do around about 30 minutes, it's sort of like a happy medium. Okay, so next, oops, where are we? Oops. Okay, so the benefits of flipping the class is that most students should be able to, in year 12, read part of a book or watch a video and take notes. That should not be too difficult for them to do. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, like this will, um, this will accommodate those lazy students, but most people should be able to do that. So if you assign this kind of activity for homework, the chances are when they come back to class, they should be able to do it. Okay, and they should have it completed. The whole point of this is so that when they get to class, they actually have some idea of the content that you're going to be covering so that you're not actually starting from scratch. So you don't have to go through and define absolutely everything. So this then allows you to spend a lot less time explaining the content and it allows you more time to apply the knowledge which they learnt in those videos um, to application type problems, okay, exam questions or things like that. And it also allows you to then to use class time to schedule more practical activities, which is a really useful way of giving students a visual um, idea of the theory that they're learning. Now, at the start of the class, so they've gone home and they've done their pre-viewing or pre-reading, they've written down a few notes. So at the start of the class, basically what you do is you ask the students, does anybody have a concept that they didn't understand? 
Okay, so, and then you can explain, you can take about five minutes to explain that particular concept so that the students now um, get it. The other idea is too, that if nobody comes up and says that they have something that they need you to help them with, you can basically ask them targeted questions to find out whether there are any misconceptions lying around. And then um, also um, any questions that they might have written down um, while they were taking the notes, you can ask those or you can answer those as well. Uh, next one. Okay, so the thing that you need to do if you wanna flip the classroom is you must hold the students accountable. Now, I must admit this is hard work at the beginning of the year, but if you don't hold them accountable, they're not going to do it for the rest of the year. So at the start of every class, you basically need to ask if they did their learning. You need to have them open their books and look at their notes. Now, at the beginning of the year, you need to do it quite frequently. But as they get into a routine and they also see the benefit of why you are flipping the classroom, that shouldn't, you shouldn't be required to do it as often. Okay, and then also again, as I mentioned in the previous slide, you can call upon students to answer questions because this also allows you to check as to whether they actually did the homework. Okay, now to avoid confusion, what you want to do is you want to make sure that any flip learning tasks, you include them on their work plan so that the students know exactly what they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do it. And this is what Nicole was talking about when she was talking about basically, you know, mapping out everything that the students are going to be doing. Okay, because if they know about it, then they are more than likely to then basically do the work. Um, allow students to know what needs to be done and don't accept any excuses. If you need to, you can keep them in a detention, make them do it at their lunchtime, ring home. Okay, but you need to hold them accountable because if they know that they can get away with not doing it, they're going to keep not doing it. So at the beginning of the year, you really need to make sure that you hold them accountable to the flipped classroom model. Um, the one advantage of doing that, as I said earlier, if they do do that preparation at home, it allows you so much more time in the classroom to go through those mole calculations, to go through, you know, doing the, the Faraday's laws and all of those kind of things and mixing them in with practical activities. Um, so during a flip class, as I mentioned at the start of the class, you ask them about the homework. And as I mentioned in the last slide, it is really critical that you keep them honest about it. Okay, ask for any questions, um, check for misunderstandings, okay. If they apply, so if the misunderstandings or the questions apply to most students, you can actually clarify them out the front and on the board, but keep it to sort of like five or 10 minutes because the last thing you wanna do is have this take up the whole of your class time because the idea of the class time is that you're there to assist them with the harder level content and that is applying the knowledge that they've learnt to um, real life situations. Um, the other thing too is make sure that you do collect their workbooks regularly um, to check for those notes and, um, and complete, um, make sure that they've completed what they need to do. Um, and I think that's basically it for me. So um, do you want me to continue or do you want to take over Alex? Yeah, happy to if you keep going. That's fine. Okay. All right. So basically VCAA exam questions. So we did have a study design change in 2016. So as you can see, we've got a list here of relevant um, exams that go um, that come into play prior to 2016. So you can use those as well if you're looking for more practical and application type of questions. Um, what have we got here? Oh, now we've got um, resources. So one of the really good resources that you can use that allows not only self-directed exploration, but it's sort of like a bit of a virtual lab, um, is the FET simulations. Like they're really, really good and there's lots of them and they cover generally most of the topics. Um, so you they can do have a lot of them all that. the time as well. So that's what's yeah. so great about it. Yeah. 
um, and the following contains some resources. So probably not worthwhile going through the rest of the the rest of the presentation because it just outlines some additional resources that you might find. The only um, one I useful. wanted to jump in on um, yep. number forty number forty nine. Yep. Um, that's something I haven't shared before so much um, and be keen to get some feedback on it from Ooh, everyone. Love it. Um, so what, there's a, a, a guy at school and then he's, he loved blockbusters and he, he made one, uh, if you've seen the game, or the, the, he, he passed away this past week, didn't he? I think Don't the know. original blockbuster host. Anyway, um, it's, a, it's a game show and basically there's, you assign questions to the particular numbers. So I use VCAR questions in the past. And then uh, there's a green team and an orange team. Every time you click one of the red squares, it will change color. And so if the, you, have, you put the question up on the board and whoever answers the question first correctly with all work working out done is the team that wins that, question, that, color, um, that, that number. Let's say question 11 was a VCAR question from two years ago and then the green team won that so then they turn that square green and it's the the team that gets from green to green you've got to make a continuous left to right or left to right for you guys or top to bottom um, and whoever wins and you can block each other as well and the instructions are in the in the powerpoint there when you open it and the other one is the family feud which i i got a few teachers to put together um, so it's it's legitimate uh, questions I formulated the questions for the family feud and then had teachers respond to that question. And then I ranked them on the most you know, responses, responses, just like a normal family feud would. And the one with the least number of responses and then yeah, students play off. And so you, you put that into the presentation mode and what um, I, I can show you if, if you'd like, um, if I share my screen, but yeah, it, it, it explains in the results basically. Um, yeah, Sorry. do you want me to do you want me to stop sharing? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds that sounds good. Please. No, I don't want to do that. Do we go until Sorry. four forty five? Yeah. Yeah, because we've only got three minutes left. That's right. Yeah. And people might so, have questions. That's the only correct. reason I cut it short. No, no, so. for sure, for sure. So yeah, it's it's in there and, and it's just like a normal family food game. Um and the, yeah, you, you use the results like you would, and it's really fun, I think. They really enjoy it. There's more questions than you need. Um, so they're two things that you might um, find useful. Um, other than that, I'll share this screen, which is all the resources and the Dropbox link in case anyone um, missed it. So you hit that, if you, drop, if you open that link, then it should give you the Dropbox, which has all the files from today. And we'll add a few extra that Nicole mentioned. Um, yeah. Otherwise, that's it from us. Thanks very much. But if you have any questions, please fire away. And don't be afraid to start your video and put yourself off mute and ask in person. <laughs> I've actually got a question for Michelle. Um, you talked about uh, like establishing a, a good classroom culture and, um, and holding students accountable for their work. Yep. How long do you reckon that takes? Um, that I reckon you've got to be at it for at least the first term. And you've got to literally ride them and nag them. And once you were set, once you establish those those practices, um, then students start to realise, well, she's serious. I'm not going to get away with it. So then they start conforming to, you know, like to doing the homework part. Um, and then that opens up that classroom that classroom time to doing so much more with it than just basic knowledge. And do you have to do it again in the start of year 12 or, or once Well, you... put it this way, in the past, I've only ever either taught the 11s and then I haven't had them into the 12s or I've taught the 12s without having the 11s. So it's always been a learning curve. I've, I haven't encountered the situation where I taught them in 11 and then I taught them in 12. But if they know your methods and they know the way you work, I can imagine that if you've had them in 11, um, in 12, it'd probably be a lot easier because they know what's going on and they know how the classroom runs. Does anyone have any other questions? Mm. 
we're always open to new members. I'll, I'll, I'll say that much as well. We're always welcoming to more people. Share so the load. Anyone, <laughs> anyone wants to join and come along and help, you know, share these resources. Be more than not willing. Oh, look, we've got a hand, I think. Is that Eleonora? She got a hand up? No, that's my, um, my mouse had a hand. Sorry. Um, in that case, I, I think I can see in the chat people are um, uh, really saying there's lots of lots of good thank yous in the chats. Um, but I would I've like got a question from Billy. Oh. Just just quickly in relation to Billy's question, resources um, for one, two, and Dropbox. Um, that in our presentation there was a slide with all the prior resources. We've done presentations for just um, unit one, two, but. Um, if I'm happy to send some resources, if we all provide our email addresses, if you guys are happy as well, yeah. um, we can share anything that you can't find up on Dropbox there as well. Yep. Sorry, Mick. Thanks, everyone. Um, thanks, thanks very much for for um, presenting today. Um, I found it totally fascinating, and I think um, from what's in the chat, there are lots of the other people in the audience were really appreciative too. Um, uh, I would encourage everyone again to um, join the Facebook uh, group of the EWCN. And if you go onto Facebook and have a look, it's, it's really easy to find. Um, but uh, so thanks very much for presenting. Uh, I remind all of you that um, the session at the November's that I, um, am second most excited about. This one, of course, is the one that I'm most excited about, but the one that I'm second most excited about uh, is on next week. So we've got um, Zoe Lowe uh, coming along. She is actually one of the people who measures um, the gases that cause climate change. And she's going to be talking about um, how she goes about doing that and uh, the instruments that she has built uh, to do that and the way that um, CSRO and other research organisations, she's from CSRO, um, do those measurements and take that data and uh, she's going to be talking about the, um, the level of proof, the, the way that you have to construct, like if you're doing an investigation on that scale, how you have to construct your data um, to be able to make it as convincing as it is. <laughs> to some. Um, so thanks, I hope I can see all of you next week, um, but otherwise, thanks everyone, and um, I, uh, I will see you next week or I'll see you around. <laughs>